the discussion. So if you open it to Anne and then um, uh, and Corinne, and then we can come back to that. But if you wanted to comment on, on Ruth's point as well, Anne and Corinne. Yeah. Anne? Um, well, uh, I, I do think that there's been quite an um, outpouring of um, work drawing on, uh, usually it's been on, drawing on social identity theory actually, to think about the ways in which um, uh, identifications with particular things uh, produce um, the, the, the far right populist movements as in the United States. So for example, that there have been um, articles arguing that, uh, and even before this last insurrection, that actually going along with a view of um, lack of entitlement through racism and so on, um, through racist discourses, racist narratives, actually produces um, identification with these movements. Um, and that, that then the sense of collect collectivity that's produced is par a partial explanation. So going to the history and um, the power relations that are in. So I think that there, there is work being done. And I mentioned before people looking at leadership and the way in which identities you know, psychologically have to be thought about around COVID and so on. So I, I think that people are beginning to do that sort of work, even about um, something that's relatively new, new, like the insurrection, where there's no, not, not any published papers yet, but people writing things. Um, uh, and I think that's a, a really good, I mean, um, uh, Jill and Kathy and you, Ruth, you know, uh, as well as Mark in the chat, have um, helped us to see that actually uh, activism does not go underground when there's crisis. It just takes particular forms. And it also is not out of the blue. The narratives matter. Because if your narrative is that this is fake news, then of course you can go out um, and uh, uh, all join together. But um, Molly mentioned Black Lives Matter, which is of course another. Um, in, around the world we saw people moving, moving together around that, but they tended to have on their masks and tried a bit to stay distance. But it said something about the narrative of this is such a crucial time just when people have learned how COVID uh, um, differentially affects um, black people, uh, the people we call in Britain, Asian people uh, who are South Asian and so on. So that there are many minoritized ethnic groups who are already unequal, who are affected by COVID. And then George Floyd happened. So you can see that, um, and it's a point that's been made in social psychology a lot, not least by somebody like Steve Reicher, that people don't just go out and riot or whatever out of the blue, senselessly, it fits in with what they're already doing. I also wanted to very quickly um, uh, talk about other forms of activism because we've already mentioned Marcus Rashford, who's a 23 year old footballer, who has really called the government to account around the school meals for impoverished young people, children um, uh, at the moment. And it, you know, that's real activism. It's had a huge impact on society. I'm slightly saddened that actually he has to keep saying things. And then now what happens, whereas before Boris Johnson used to ignore him and poo poo it, he now phones him up and say, says, we're going to do something. So, so Johnson is individualizing what is a collective appeal, but nonetheless that matters. So that's one thing. I think independent sage, which I've mentioned before, uh, it contains people from various disciplines, but a lot of psychologists, people like Susan Mishy, um, uh, Liz Stoko, uh, we've already mentioned Stephen Reicher, and, and so on. I can't go through mentioning them all. John Drury, <laughs> mention another one, um, uh, who give of their time to actually think about, you know, how does this make sense and what things would work to help in, in the COVID situation. And one of the things that we have done is produce a paper that as yet has not been put up on the website because we, there are just so many more important things at the moment around the vaccine, around um, uh, variations and so on. Um, but on stigma and inequality, so very much um, fitting with, was it Jill or Kathy? I can't remember which one of you said something around um, uh, the, 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 the stigma that comes from othering people. I mean, so, so that this, uh, you know, and it's something we've seen a great deal that various groups, Muslim groups, for example, have been blamed for spreading 
um, COVID by their behavior, by having too many people at funerals and so on. And the BBC, for example, um, had one after another, uh, a picture of, I can't remember who's, one of the Charlton's funerals with hundreds of people following the coffin um, and said nothing about COVID or anything like that. And then, uh, uh, the day before, a picture of a mosque, no people, a depopulated picture um, saying that, that uh, funerals um, from mosques were causing the spread of COVID. So that just tells you a great deal about how the stigma. And also we've seen um, Chinese people in Britain as well as in the States being much more subjected to hate crime. They're the group for whom hate crime has gone up enormously with COVID. So, um, you know, those narratives matter as well. But independent sages and I mean, it's not an activist organization, I suppose, but it, it's, its activism has been crucially important, I think. And then I think that there also, um, I went for Independence Age to a, um, a trades union meeting a couple of weeks, weeks ago. And it, I was astonished at the number of worker struggles that are going on and the worker strikes because of people being pushed on the front line to do things that they're frightened about, that they don't want to do. But if they don't do them, they won't get any money and lots of support and so on. I was also struck by, um, it's during this time of pandemic that um, uh, Kiss, somebody, somebody called uh, Ella Kissy Deborah, who those outside Britain won't have heard of, but for seven years, she has whipped up activism around the fact that her nine-year-old daughter seven years ago died from asthma in the most horrific way. And it's the very first person in Britain who now has on their death certificate that it was caused by air quality. Um, so, uh, you know, that's activism. She's mobilized huge numbers of people and all of us know about it because of that. Also, the activism uh, around something that came to light at the beginning of the pandemic, the, um, the, uh, the five times more group, uh, which is beginning to be really active, which is about the fact that something I didn't know myself, that black women in Britain are five times more likely to die in childbirth than white women. You know, I think that's a, I mean, I'm not suggesting that many people die in childbirth. Thank goodness they don't. But actually that this could be happening in the 21st century. And, and I think it's activism has been fueled by the inequalities, by the fact that, uh, you know, sort of people are at home more and seeing things happen. There are also lots of activism around mental health, both for children and um, other people, as we realise that people's mental health is affected by the pandemic and the fears and so on. Uh, and also I think activism of people who are doing things like counselling and so on really matters. Sorry, I've gone on a bit long, but I do think that there are all these things going on that are interesting. And they're so interrelated um, and quite a lot of the examples you just gave us um, are related to all the questions we were debating. Can we just hear from Corinne before we wrap this session on this matter? Thank you, Corinne. Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I've been doing some work with colleagues in Brazil and Zambia and South Africa, actually, um, uh, with people with HIV. Um, they're talking with us about what their COVID experiences are. And many of them are people that, that have activist histories or are activists. And yeah, they've been, uh, they feel cut off from that. It's been difficult. You know, they, they have uh, digital restrictions, data restrictions, um, just service restrictions, um, uh, platform restrictions, all kinds of restrictions that make that difficult for them. Um, that's certainly true. And, and I think there's, you know, a, a sense in which um, the kinds of activisms that we're familiar with physically being somewhere in your body has, be has become very difficult. You might remember the, um, the doctor, Mina Viz, who was standing outside, pregnant outside number 10 Downing Street for many days, uh, protesting PPE, a lack uh, for uh, health professionals. That was, that was an exceptional, person's body there you know it was, at that time it was no longer many people doing this and and I also feel that it's 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 you know young people who've, who've protested themselves who've put their bodies on the line often masked and so on I mean in, in a sense they've been um uh, uh you know they've been um uh, left there with really little evidence that that's actually okay you know the notion that it's going to be okay for young people to have covid is extremely dubious you know there are all kinds of studies about long-term effects um known studies that have been known about it's not like a secret 
um, that have been known about, about long-term effects of, of COVID on the body of um, asymptomatic young people who, who've had COVID. So I think that's really um, uh, something uh, unforgivable, actually. Um, but then on the more positive side of this, as, as um, people have said, you know, people have been able to uh, organize uh, 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 um, online um, without that kind of restriction around um, uh, what, what, we, what we used to always think was necessary, you know, a flight, a conference, a hotel, all that stuff, clearly not necessary, you know, people don't need that. Um, so that's, that's been a really important change and many people of course can organize uh, using uh, different kinds of connectivity. It doesn't have to be full internet. People can use, like, like, like Uganda, as Charlotte's just mentioned, the Uganda case. Uganda was particularly, the recent political organizing was particularly dependent on WhatsApp, I think. So, you know, it, it doesn't, doesn't have to be all the same kind. Um, and I think in, in relation to what others have also talked about, there are some really interesting um, ways of organizing that people have developed. So, for instance, the people... Um, uh, that I was talking about that, that our uh, participants living with HIV have very often come into coalition with people with other health, health conditions to work around COVID. In fact, that's become part, that's almost institutionalized in the Zambian context where COVID and HIV are now educated about and, and, and awareness is kind of raised together uh, around that. Um, other examples are, are all those mutual aid societies in the UK, for instance, that we've seen um, and, as, and, and as Ruth has pointed out, and I think um, uh, was, was Anne also saying this, that, you know, there's been a lot more, I think, I think there's a, a strength now around union organising that there hasn't been for some time. Um, people are, uh, well, certainly in our union, people are joining uh, unions more than they were. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's a really inter interesting thing to happen when we thought that unions had been um, almost killed off in some ways. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Corinne, very insightful. Um, does anyone have any comments? Marcy, can I just check with Teresa about something? Teresa, because um, so, I see that we're at four o'clock, so I wanted to see if that's a fast end, because if so, we will try to adhere to that. Yeah, you can carry on if, if we need to, but we, we should probably also be mindful that other people probably need to go places. So we, we always have a few more minutes. Perfect. Uh, that's really wonderful. And I just um, thank you so much. I, I, I think that's great. Well, if uh, Molly, just, just before, if anybody else decides to leave us before we end, just to tell you, we will be recording we will be uploading uh, this recording of the discussion. And since so many of you have participated, I've posted a little note in the chat. If you would like not to be featured in the video, I can edit it out, but do get in touch with me, identifying yourself so I know how to do that. So we can respect your privacy. That's, yeah. and I am sorry, I realized after we were doing that, that all of a sudden I was like, wait a minute, um, thinking about that. Thank you for, for raising that. Um, can I just, um, I mean, there's such great stuff in the chat here, really wonderful. Um, and I wondered um, if I could call attention to Jim McCauley's uh, wonderful comment here. Jim, are you, are you still with us here? Um, so Jim's written here, Whatever happened to all the extremely progressive narratives that emerged at the beginning will never go back to the old ways. Things must change, seem to have dissipated or at least not been harnessed. Jim, I wondered if you'd like to say a few words, like your own thoughts on that. It'd be really interesting. I think you're absolutely right. I think many of us read and were very um, touched by Aaron D. Roy's um, wonderful article about the portal and which way will we go? And this is a, you know, the the hint we're sitting on the hinge of history, and somehow that that moment feels quite different to this moment. I mean, we're still in the midst of it, but um, and the idea that this is a um, story that is still very, very, very much in motion. Um, but Jim, would you like to say anything about that? Well, I think you said it all for me, Wally. That, that's exactly what I was thinking. I mean, it, it's just, it strikes me that those days are no longer with us. I mean, I remember Paul and I wrote something in, in the very early days of COVID and we were trying to harness a lot of thoughts and there were a lot of thoughts around about, you know, communities were going to become much more important. Uh, the, 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 the power of the state was going to be taken away from them and people were going to organise at a local level 
Uh, all those sorts of thoughts seem to be in very common currency and not just in academic narratives, but in, in populist narratives as well. Uh, and they, they have been eroded since, since then. And I, I think we've probably um, covered quite a few of the reasons why, why they have been eroded. But I, I'm not sure um, that, that, that um, you know, I, I don't. Th I think you're right. We're, we're, we're not going to get those days back. But I'm still not quite sure what happened to, to that spirit of, of collectivity that, that, that was around as, a, as an initial response. Really interesting. Would anybody, um, Marcy? Well, would I don't know if anybody um, in the audience or of the other panelists would like to um, contribute to that, or if we should be drawing to a close. Maybe Paul has something to say, does he? Because he, he was. Uh... I think I think Paul might Paul have. Left, left. All right, then he I doesn't have anything. He to say. literally <laughs> just left. Yes. Um, I just wanted. I mean, if people have time to comment on um, the issues around um, transnational aspects of inequalities and the provision of vaccination now, because as we see, for example, Covax has been organised as a way to kind of get vaccine to developing countries, but we don't know really how much um, that would kind of um, actualize. So that's one thing about international kind of or global inequality. And the other one was what Nira was mentioning earlier about borders and about the intersecting narratives of how different um, national agendas turn into kind of intersecting each other and impacting uh, the impact of each narrative. So I wondered um, whether anybody had any comments on transnationalism and kind of global inequality. Maybe Corinne, that's kind of your area. <laughs> Well, I, I know. I'm, all I can all I can say about this is that I think people in um, well, when we were when we were doing this research recently, uh, people in Zambia and South Africa and Brazil, but particularly in Zambia, were immediately alert to exactly what this might mean um, for them and for others in terms of reduced resources and competition for resources, um, in terms of even medication for HIV, which you would think was mm. some kind of thing that would be you know, sacrosanct or something, but they were, they were clear that was not the case. And I actually raised this with David Navarro at one point saying, is this competition going to happen? He was like, yes, this is going to happen. So it's, um, I think it's clearly seen from the global south what might happen uh, in the aftermath or in the, or in the continuation of COVID. Uh, again, that might be partly a cover, it's largely a cover story of, of, of withdrawal from uh, this kind of funding. Um, uh, but it's it's well seen, and um, uh, you know people are already thinking of ways to to mitigate. Um, an, an interesting area of this might be the provision of generics um, around COVID, which would be a very important uh, political fight to start on. Uh, so far, hasn't really been tested at all. Um, but you would you would think that this would be immediate reaction of most drug companies <laughs> to offer, given that there's a history in the previous pandemic of having to offer it at some point. Uh, drug companies have so far failed signally to do anything around that. Thank you. Okay. We if, should probably... Yeah, maybe we should just um, wrap it. Um, on behalf of CNR and ISPP and um, um, all the participants in this panel, I thank you for staying um, on a late kind of Friday afternoon. And um, I really enjoyed it. And I'm sure you did as well. Um, and maybe let's applause the our speakers. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. And Masi, thank you so much for sharing. I want to say it's although we have a lot of wonderful members from ISPP here, it's a, it's the third UK conference of political psychology, which is just wonderful because uh, Teresa and Casey and others have been building this. Um, group, which is just really fantastic. So thank you so much to them. And uh, Teresa or Kezi, I don't know if you would like to close this or Anne, I see you have a hand up there. Yeah, could I, could I just say thank you, Teresa and Kezi. I've really enjoyed the session, but I wanted to say a final, um, before we, we all break up, real thank you to the Center for Narrative Research. I, I think that the issues that have come up and the comments that you from the center have had, have illustrated 
how it is that you've managed to be, be both intellectually leading and also politically engaged in ways that I think have helped so many of us to see the future. So I'm so pleased that you've had these 20 years and that, that I have been uh, you know, a peripheral part of um, uh, CNR and benefited. And I just think that what you do and what you'll do into the future is so crucial. So I just wanted to say thank you. Can I, can I add to that exactly on that note? I had exactly the same feeling in this session, especially having been at the conference all week, um, you know, and being kind of tired and emotional on a Friday afternoon kind of thing. Uh, what you really illustrate as a centre and all, all the colleagues around the table, um, actually Kathy Reesman really kind of nailed it for me when she said at one point, cries out for analysis. And I thought that that just absolutely encapsulates it for me is, is that you are able, I think, as a community and an epistemic community to combine engagement, activism and this kind of steady, calm scholarship, um, which I think we really value. And, and, you know, here's to another 20, 20 years of CNR, as far as I'm concerned. Wow. Thank you so much uh, for giving us this opportunity. I didn't even write to um, anything in the chat there. It's just very, very moving to and a privilege for us to be part of this community uh, that we all build together. There's a lot, lot more to figure out together. Um, a lot of challenges in front of us. And we also, I think I can say this specifically for Karn and myself, I think we feel your solidarity so very much at this moment. Uh, it really is the wind in our sails. So um, thanks so much for that. And uh, yeah, so thank you, everyone. Thanks for um, also um, letting us, we've went on a little bit. That's also CNR, but uh, anyway, have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank so you all. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.